All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mainspring's monthly VCIO Perspectives webinar, where we have our virtual chief information officers share trends, tips, and information and real world experiences around relevant topics to help you maintain and grow your business. Uh, this morning, I'm joined by Jeremy Keiko, our lead virtual chief information officer. How are you, Jeremy? I'm doing well, thanks, Ray. Uh, just a little bit about Mainspring. Um, we, we've been doing this for 30 years. We're an IT consulting and strategy and support firm uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, over the last 30 years, we've gained a lot of insights and best practices on how to make IT uh, strategic, predictable, uh, cost effective, uh, and uh, really targeted and focused around helping organizations grow and retain their talent as well. So this morning's topic is one I hope is, is timely. Uh, as you prepare for the new year, and it's focused around budgeting, uh, jump-starting annual budgeting. Hopefully, uh, for many of you, uh, this is not a starting from scratch uh, scenario as we uh, near the new year. Uh, the goal of today is really to focus around simplifying and automating uh, budgeting for small to medium-sized businesses, nonprofits, and associations, how to control and optimize current technology investments, which I'm sure is a, a, a challenge that all of us face, how to discover and eliminate costs that are leaking, um, I think is going to be uh, highly valuable as we're all um, looking at the bottom line and looking at where maybe we, we can find opportunities to save money. After the webinar, we're going to be sending everyone who registered a uh, template uh, that can be used if you're starting, you are starting from scratch or if you've got something that you want to augment your current budgeting. Um, so let's jump right into it. Uh, a few statistics around IT spending. Uh, the average uh, organization, and we've heard this for, for years, is about one to two problems per person per month uh, with a resolution time that goes anywhere from 30 minutes to uh, an hour or two per problem uh, being resolved. And that's, uh, that's really where we see opportunity with organizations looking at those soft costs that are affecting their, their, uh, their staff. And as you would imagine, with uh, issues being resolved on a break-fix mentality, uh, most organizations see employees just uh, find workarounds rather than report problems and, and solve solve them for good. Uh, but it's uh, it's a huge cost to an organization. Um, also, we've got downtime. Um, you, you've seen startling figures, I'm sure, Jeremy, that go, you know, uh, from from this point and beyond. Uh, and yeah. this really speaks to not only hard costs but soft costs and opportunity costs. So uh, most of our, sure. our yeah. And both of these two top items really lend uh, heavily towards investing in your infrastructure and making sure that you're keeping things up to date in that regard, right? So if you're talking about eliminating downtime, uh, one of the biggest keys uh, and ways that you can get in front of eliminating that downtime is to make sure that you're doing planned uh, re refreshing refreshments of that hardware over the course of time, looking at your warranty period for a workstation and making sure you're holding to a planned three to four year turnover. Gardner has a has a study out that computers start to lose, you know, uh, a large percentage of their uh, efficiencies after three years, and there's a higher likelihood of breakage once you hit that four year term. So plan to be refreshing those computers every four years, servers, uh, and other hardware, five to six years. And again, that's a heavy focus in terms of, of one of the focus areas of, of budgeting is looking at those hardware refresh uh, timelines and keeping in front of them. Those are great tips for sure. Okay. Um, we're talking about, um, you know, losing, um, you know, you're losing and retaining and, and finding new staff, right? I think I, I've run across more organizations in the past year and a half where they uh, have resolved in either being or calling themselves a technology company because they're moving their model and focus around how technology grows their organization, their membership generates revenue, or that they're in the talent um, acquisition or retention business because they know that they need professional services to hit the ground. They've got a large backlog of work to complete and they can't find the right people to work with it and build clients and serve customers um, or that they've got great people and they want to make sure that those people stick around for the long haul. Uh, the cost of turnover is significant and one that um, it doesn't seem to escape any any industry. Well, recruiting costs are through the roof for certain, you know, and, and put 
put yourself in that position then of, of your your new employees that are coming on board and you're already giving them a five-year-old workstation again to talk about you know the equipment that people are are using whether it be you know the business applications that are in use or the specific hardware that they're being given the impression that that employee gets coming right out the right out of the gate uh, in terms of the equipment that they're being given the tools that they're being given to perform those duties uh, reflects heavily in terms of the value that they feel coming into the organization and where they go. Uh, and then you can roll that into existing employees as well, you know, as you're looking for those. $1,500 for a computer is certainly a small price to pay where you don't have to then go out and pay thousands of the recruiting costs for that for those employees' replacements, right? So um, if you want to think about it that way. The tech stack alone, uh, you know, a, a typical question in uh, in job interviews that we see and others are, you know, what's the day in the life of this position? What does it entail? Inevitably, yeah. it's going to talk around processes and technologies that are being used. And employees are pretty savvy uh, to know, you know, the type of technology that you're using and how that works from their day to day. And if they can see or read between the lines the amount of uh, mundane manual tasks or things that are not supported from a technology perspective, they can get a good sense of where they're going to be two, three years down the line and whether they want to jump in and be part of a, a, a growing company that needs to innovate or if they, they want to join one that already has well-defined processes and technologies to support their, their goals. Absolutely. So all of that leads to say that obviously uh, tech budgets are increasing, continuing to increase. Uh, over the next year, right? So as people are are staying in front of these spends, not to mention, you know, factoring in inflation and everything else into, you know, the rising cost of equipment and, and technology uh, subscriptions and everything that goes along with that, you know, uh, we're expecting uh, certainly a rise in spending. I think uh, Gartner put it at, mm -hmm. at four trillion dollars for for twenty twenty three in in tech spend. That's right. So yeah, that's right. All right. So spending's going up. Talent's hard to come by. Uh, there's a lot of lost time uh, and cost to an organization. But let's get it, let's get our arms and heads wrapped around budgeting uh, and how to really make it simple and automated. Uh, you know, as we stated from the beginning, uh, we're an IT firm. We work with our clients on a regular basis to make IT uh, spending and budgeting simple in a more continuous fashion. So let's kind of dive right in and, and talk through some of the ways that your organization, if you're not working with a partner or if you do and, and want to simplify and automate things, how to go about doing that. Yeah, so so it, a lot of it revolves around auditing, right? So look, you want to audit your your hardware, your software, uh, your infrastructure, um, but you also want to automate. You know, look at your automation tools. You want to audit against you know uh, the 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 business technology that your organization is using. Um, you know, and and create a defined roadmap. We talked a little while ago about uh, tracking on uh, the hardware for, for your employees and replace and doing replacement cycles. Keep those into an IT roadmap that can go out two, three, four years down the, the line and you already know what these hard costs are gonna be, you know, year after year as you're developing that roadmap and tracking on those. Then you wanna also develop uh, a way that you're auditing against the uh, the metrics and outcomes of those of those categories, right? So you wanna make sure that you're, you're pulling your different departments within the organization and, and making sure that they have the tools that they need uh, to continue moving forward, what deficiencies that they're seeing and making sure that, that you're assessing against uh, all of those, those pieces that are in there. Um, you know, you wanna look at new dev that may be required, new development that may be required for uh, new goals of the organization or to better enhance your current uh, product delivery or, or, or everything that kind of touches along those pieces, right? Um, and then you wanna, wanna plan uh, to spend accordingly as you develop that roadmap as we talked about. Um, tracking inventory and expirations. Uh, so again, the hardware, the domain names, the SSL renewals, all of the key things that you know are gonna be spent uh, year after year after year, you know, that, that you're going to need to continue to invest in uh, as you move those those pieces forward. Um, yeah, you, yeah, you talk ahead. a lot about um, sort of the the things that we need to track, the things that we need to be aware of. And a yep. lot of this stuff goes into um, goes into a budgeting tool, whether it's, uh, you know, QuickBooks Online or, or another, you know, um, another budgeting tool. It's entered once. 
where else is that information being stored? And so, you know, it's very easy to look at this list and start producing numbers and figures and things in Excel spreadsheets. The challenge with that becomes that's doing it once every single time, every single year, or maybe two to three times a year if you're updating your budget and forecast. And yep. really, there's a lot of wasted energy and time roped around that manual task, whereas there are actual technology tools that either an IT department or an outsourced IT partner should be managing for you and taking advantage of the automation to know, for example, something simple, when a software licensing agreement is coming it's up for renewal expire. or when yeah, it's going to sure. expire. And not only that, when should the tasks and meetings occur around the auditing of that solution before it's too late for the auto renewals, right? We all, we all track renewals and when, when things are going to expire, various software subscriptions and providers have you know, 30, 60, 90, some 90 six day. months out for auto, re, auto uh, renewals where it takes that, that decision out of your, out of your hands and you, you lack the ability to make any kind of pivot before those automatic renewals happen. Especially when you're talking about vendor relationships, right? When you're talking about your ISP, you're talking about your phone vendor. A lot of them are going to renew you and lock you back into another two to three year term as those pieces come up. So you want to make sure that you're ahead of those notifications. You should be tracking against the notification window as opposed to the actual expiration window point. Uh, in regards to those, those details. Yeah. So let's, uh, before we move on, talk a little bit around auditing. I think everyone who, uh, who's running a business nowadays understands and may, maybe carries a negative connotation around auditing um, as far as, you know, whether it's coming from a financial side, there's compliance auditing. Uh, talk a little bit about why continuous auditing has a place in small to medium-sized businesses as opposed to these once-of-year occurrences. Yeah, so the biggest thing is that I, I think uh, – the standards change, right? And and lately the standards change more frequently than once a year. So, you know, as we're as we're going through security um, is a continuously evolving uh, piece of your business. So it, it, there are always new technologies, new best practices, new enhancements that are coming out, right? We're seeing every year the insurance industry is changing their requirements for security. Uh, and the pieces required for cyber coverage that, that go into there. And if you're failing on any one point with some of these insurance providers, they're denying you outright, right? So you want to make sure that you're ahead of those pieces and that you're continuing, continuing to adapt and not just working off of last year's paperwork that you filled out for those insurance renewals, right? That you're, you're tracking against what these new requirements are coming in um, so that you're poised uh, to be ready to move forward with that when that comes in. Um, you know, and, and the same thing across uh, other enhancements of technologies as well. Um, you know, when, when you go in and, and you're looking for enhanced productivity, uh, you want to continue to audit against that. You want to audit internally against your departments in terms of, you know, the tools that they're, they're using and, and continuing to work against that. But you also need to be prepared for those surprises uh, for some of those pieces that come out, right? So, um, you know, when, when we talk about the insurance, most of the, the insurance, uh, uh, technologies all of a sudden, you know, had a few changes that came in that weren't uh, even even advertised, but they took a bath uh, as we went through the pandemic, right? They got hit with a number of claims that came out of that as people transitioned to remote work and everything that goes along with that. So, you know, you do need to be prepared for some of those emergency spends uh, or unplanned surprises. Well, and I think that's that's a perfectly good uh, example. If you, you're working with an outside provider or an IT firm, um, explaining to them if they haven't already brought to you, besides what's already on your IT roadmap, what are the, the quote unquote surprise spends or costs that they see coming across the industry to small to medium sized businesses? Ideally, you've got an IT, a head of IT or an IT partner that is bringing some of these to you, to you that may not be the ordinary infrastructure or IT spend, right? It may be on the fringe of what your IT partner or team supports. It could be supporting, you know, uh, evolution and technology costs around hosting um, websites. It could be around your internet service provider, which your IT partner or your IT department has no control over. Just understanding what 
the trends are, what they're seeing across the industry, and to make sure that you provide that buffer. It's obviously a lot easier for most organizations to build in that buffer for unplanned uh, expenses. Nobody wants, right? That's been a large critique of the IT industry over over the years. How do we make IT spending predictable? Yeah. Um, and and planning for some of those surprises really talk, you know, goes into what are you seeing across the industry? What are you seeing from other clients? And where do you see, you know, how are you having routine check-ins with those providers to eliminate some of those surprises? So I think a lot of the surprises come from when, when we start working with uh, newer clients uh, as well, right? So uh, they weren't getting the same advice, you know, previously, and they weren't getting those, those so they start mid-budget cycle already, and there's all of this unplanned spend because nobody talked to them about whether it be multi-factor authentication, whether, you know, uh, whether, you know, a number of, of different technologies that are out there, they hadn't really been advised of it. So that's where we see a lot of the surprises come into play. Uh, most of the other things end up coming into uh, a shift in policy, shift in, in uh, goals, um, you know, of organizations. And, and it really depends on, on the planning that is done, you know, as you head into that fiscal year, so. Yeah. There's there's quite a few tips here uh, around how to make um, IT budgeting uh, simple and, pre and predictable and more automated. The two that stand out to me, uh, my experience, I'm curious what your, your experience has been, Jeremy, are documenting items that can't be cut and starting from there, right? Starting with uh, the level of severity or criticality of some solutions and not yeah. front loading uh, the first quarter, which I think a lot of folks would, uh, would appreciate because there typically is a rush, whether your quarter is calendar year or fiscal year, not front yep. in that first quarter provides you a little bit more opportunity to evaluate solutions and your spend in the future. What are you saying? So yeah, I think it depends, uh, obviously, uh, on industry. Uh, it depends on budget cycle. There's, you know, certain organizations and nonprofits that get uh, that work off of certain donations and funding and grants and different things along those lines. And they're just waiting until that grant comes in. So once the grant comes in, they're going to dump the cash into, you know, and, and execute on those. There's other other industries that, you know, have their their budget more aligned to, you know, uh, other uh, income uh, that is driven throughout the rest of the year. And those are the, the areas that you want to focus on trying to split those pieces off, right? But yeah, I mean, as far as the things in here, it's easy to uh, document the items that, that can and can't be cut, right? So uh, you know you're going to require, you know, uh, your laptops for your employees and this, that, and the other. The other ones that should be put on an evaluation. And this is the benefit of actually um, starting the budget cycle and season uh, a bit earlier. The earlier you start that, um, the more you'll have a better idea of what what actually can be cut. And and realistically, you know, uh, this is something where where you know you want to you want to focus on um, you know comparing uh, your budget to the actual P and L as you go through the year because then you know you're 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 able to determine a lot of those pieces as as you continue through the season um, and through your budget uh, working to see what pieces are fitting in where. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about controlling current uh, technology investments. Makes sense to start with what you have and then look to the future as well and, and look to the organization's strategic plan. But let's talk a little bit about metrics. Um, what, what you're seeing as far as an industry standard uh, when it comes to measuring you know, IT cost effectiveness, uh, when it comes to um, what kind of return on investment we're getting from solutions, and then how that plays a role into you know business outcomes, not just talent acquisition and retention, but uh, moving the organization forward. Yeah, so when you're talking about different pieces of your budget, there are those those certain bottom layer items that are those necessities. The other pieces are the ones that you want to really track the ROI against, right? So you want to determine you know how efficient your your uh, your AMS system is for your staff. You want to do periodic uh, deep dives within the organization to talk to departments about the tools that they're using, how much spread you've got of, of different departments using different tools, and is there an area for overlap and kind of bringing all of those pieces back together so that you can determine, you know, uh, if there's a more cost-effective way or a more streamlined way uh, of delivering your technology stack out to the organization. Um, you know, you always wanna be looking at your process, um, you know, and, and the business model. Uh, when you're planning for a new initiative, you wanna have certain goals in mind and you wanna track against what those goals are. And that's the biggest, 
determination, I think, of the ROI that you're going to hit. You should have those objectives going into uh, most of those those spends before you even get to those pieces. Um, and then as you implement, you know, you're again, you're comparing your P&L against your your budget. You're comparing uh, your implementation cost against the the rewards that the organization is getting, and you're keeping your finger on the pulse of the benefits of those changes throughout the organization in order to to help. Uh, uh, determine what those pieces are going to be. Um, well, you, you know, mentioned it, deep diving into departments, and I don't, mean, I don't mean to interrupt you, Jeremy, but you know, reimagining processes, technology architectures, and business models. Sure. I mean, that that dives um, pretty deep into a pretty hot topic that we covered a few months ago around business automation uh, and and the the spend and the estimated spend on organizations that are trying to accomplish what they've long said, which is how do we uh, keep the talent we have and do more with less. Or how do we be more efficient? And to your point, how do you keep staff, the talented staff, highly paid staff that are that are doing repeatable tasks? How do we help those organizations, particularly those departments, uncover the needs and have the discussion uh, when we're talking about people that are typically in a department at an organization, for example, and they don't know what they don't know, right? They don't oh. know what exists out there, so they're not going to come to the table, let's say at a manager meeting, or they don't want to come to a manager meeting without, with a problem, without a solution. How do organizations root that, that business process out within the departments to then start, uh, you know, reimagining the processes and evaluating what technologies exist to streamline things? How's that yeah, done? Most, most of the time a technology uh, partner or, or vendor is going to be meeting with uh, a core group uh, of, of people in, in leadership of the organization, and they're not necessarily meeting on a department level. So you're reliant then upon uh, those uh, needs of departments getting filtered up through the top. Whereas if you can make your technology partner available to the departments themselves to allow your, your, your VCIO to have direct conversations with department leads, you know, you can continue to move those pieces forward rather than having just a top-down delivery approach. You actually get in within the organization and have those conversations. But I think, you know, in addition to even looking at those, you know, you also want to look at the actual technology that's out there. There's changes that come in uh, year over year, and you want to reevaluate those pieces as well, right? You want to look at uh, things like your phone system, the, the antiquated, you know, I've got a phone handset on my desk is, is becoming obsolete now as people are working remotely, people are working from the road, everybody is, is utilizing Teams or Zoom or some other kind of uh, platform and they're used to utilizing those to where, you know, you can actually move your phone system into these tools that people are already using, eliminate the costs of, you know, having those handsets on the desk that you're paying per user $10 a month for, or a flat outright fee when you're, you know, deploying your system, looking at those types of, of areas and looking at the changes that, that have uh, been made, have been afforded to uh, businesses to rethink the way that, that their architecture and operating uh, models are, have been running. So, yeah. you know, I think that's another key that, to look into there. And you also want to continue to evaluate uh, the, the other relationships you've got. We mentioned earlier in terms of looking at the notice that you have to provide to different vendors and, and uh, for those relationships, but, you know, look at what the costs are for your print vendors, for your ISP. Are there cheaper and better alternatives that are out there that'll still deliver within the business needs that you have? And I think that's a heavy key. You're always going to be able to find something cheaper, but is it going to de deliver the same level uh, of consulting, the same level of delivery, the same level of performance that you've got right now? And are you, or are you able to make changes uh, to help lower your your bottom line and move move the organization forward. Yeah, you mentioned something about having uh, priorities on technology solutions and decisions driven from the top down. I think what we've seen with the proliferation of applications, right? There are a lot of other solutions out there that may not be name brand, they may not be name recognizable, that are hitting the inboxes of different department heads and different end users, and then those groups are taking it upon themselves as they would and should sure. to look at those solutions, do their evaluations, and then come all the way through that process to then start involving their head of IT or then start yep. involving their partners. I think to your point, involving that team a little earlier and just saying, look, we're in the discovery phase of just understanding, is this solution a comparable product? 
what what's our process for evaluating solutions and and to benefit from not only the heads of IT but those those department heads and the partners they're collecting information across the entire organization and they may be able to help shortcut either by understanding what other business needs exist within the organization or if it's an outside partner you know looking left and looking right and and, and sharing you know what's going on in their space with comparable type, types of clients and, type, and comparable types of businesses and helping to shortcut that process to identify you know are you overspending are you underspending should this technology solution even be under your consideration yeah 100 percent. and we we've actually seen when you talk about um you know the sprawl of applications within an organization you know you come in and talk to several different departments and you find out you know that different departments had a need for something like electronic signing and we find out that one department's using mm -hmm. hello sign another one's using DocuSign, another one's using sure. built-in adobe features you know and and you can have a more cost-effective solution when you bundle these together and 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 a lot you know those pieces that you need together so well, and you don't know what you don't know. So how well is all that information? How well are all the software applications? Is all the infrastructure and all the IT, how well is that documented? Is it being centrally managed to give your IT team or partner one place to go to be able to see where there may be overlap? I think uh, the commercial that comes to mind, I don't know who the provider is, but it's more on a business or a, uh, a business to consumer standpoint, is the idea of having an application that'll go through your account, find all your subscriptions and tell you where you're overspending or what things you're not using and automatically un unenroll you or unsubscribe you applications. Essentially, right. this is a business to business solution. Having technology stacks and a centralized IT view of things helps identify where you might be leaking money. And so um, that's where I feel like uh, not only the approach, but the technology stack come together can really find cost savings. And it's becoming harder too, right? As, the, as uh, platforms move to cloud hosted sure. solutions where you're just managing it through a web page, you're no longer seeing, you know, it's not like you can just run an audit against the computers and see what's installed on the computers anymore. You're yeah. talking about all of these cloud platforms that people don't have to have administrative rights to go out and use, but yet they're putting a company credit card down and, and those expenses are gonna continue to roll in without necessarily being seen in terms of the way that those are using, so being utilized. So you have to look at those across the organization. Well, let's dive into some of these costs. We've got hard costs, we've got soft costs. I think the only thing missing is opportunity cost. Um, actually, it's there on soft costs. So that's a really yeah. difficult one to uh, to calculate, but touch on a few hard costs that you feel like have been you know, front mind with with some of our clients and some of the other organizations you've been working with. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the big ones is is training, right? As uh, technology evolves, training is one that I think uh, you know most businesses should be leaning heavier, more heavily on. Whether it's security training, whether it's uh, new technology training, whether you know. Uh, different pieces that go along with that. Th those are certainly huge. Uh, the advancements in HR uh, platforms and, and utilizing those pieces uh, have changed significantly over the last five years. Uh, so if, if you know, you're know you just working off of legacy, well, we've always done it this way kind of uh, behaviors moving in, uh, these are areas I think where, where organizations should take a hard look at the way that those pieces are going. We've already touched on the third-party contracts. Again, you know, you should be looking at those uh, every few years in terms of the way that those pieces are are, are coming across. Um, your subscription services, those those are are certainly huge. We I can't tell you how many times we've come into an organization and seen either over provisioned licensing. Yeah. We've seen you know uh, nonprofits that are paying you know uh, full full fare. Uh, rather than taking advantage of the 501c3 uh, licensing uh, benefits that are out there, a number of those things that are 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 um, are, are up for grabs out there that that you want to be focusing on. Um, we we hit on the technology downtime at the beginning. Uh, you know, I, and if you're looking at employee productivity, that ties into there. It's a soft cost, but I think more businesses sure. really should look at that as a, as an actual hard cost. Because you know your salary is is the biz biggest expense within most organizations. Right. So you know as you're looking at that, um, there is a hard cost that is tied towards your employee productivity. You know based on the outcome that's coming out of those. Um, yeah, and I think at this point, you know, putting those putting that in perspective, you know, the employee cost, right? The average person of an organization uh, is is managing IT in either a reactive way or they just don't have enough staff to get things done. You can count on those one to two tickets per person per month with an average resolution time one to two hours. You multiply it by your you know loaded hourly rate and, and you turn to your team and you say, how do we 
how do we lower this number? And how do we track it on a regular basis? Because this, the cost of employee non-productivity is there. Plus you have, if, if there is a reactive model in place, you have what is what is typical, either hoarding of information uh, of information or risk. You've got silent suffering of end users who don't put problems in because they report them and nothing ever gets solved at a root from a root cause basis. And then you've got uh, workarounds, which are for a cybersecurity um, that organization are the root of, of most issues. You know, if you allow uh, organizations and employees um, to continue on a path of reactive technology support, uh, there will be uh, holes in the security uh, firewall, uh, which is humans, right? That's and the worst that's one to come out of all of those are, are where, you know, it's called, it's the leaning over and, you know, hey, have you seen this before? And now all of a sudden you've got two or three people shoulder surfing. Sure. Now yeah. you've just lost the productivity of three of yeah. your employees as they work to support, sure. you know, that end user. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think um, when it comes to a, a lot of the things um, you mentioned on heart costs, it, it really kind of comes down to what's the process and methodology behind doing these things. How are vendors managed? Um, and how is your technology team involved? Subscription services, you're right. You've got software that gets loaded onto computers themselves, and then you've got cloud software. How well uh, are organizations documenting, in your opinion, um, overall, when we fall in on a, on a new organization, documenting what end users have subscriptions to? And to your point, if you don't have a proper onboarding or offboarding process or documentation, you could end up with or, you know, employees that have access to cloud software that no one ever knew existed, which is a security concern, um, especially if you're looking at it from an intellectual capital perspective, but then also um, you know, a security concern on, on, on the other end as well. So how, how often are you seeing that, that come up and, and what are some of the solutions? Yeah, so most of the time it's horrible. Look, it's it's challenging even when you've got a method to be able to to manage and track on those pieces. And if you don't, um, it's it's nearly impossible. So um, I can tell you, you know, most of that documentation doesn't exist coming into new new organizations. Um, so putting it into place, doing the discovery, the due diligence of finding those pieces. Um, you know, is is certainly a a, a little bit of uh, effort to get to those points, and then it's it's a continuous uh, commitment that that has to be made. And even if you're tracking in real time, there should still be other audits that are run throughout the course of the year, where on a quarterly basis, biannual basis, you're still looking at at what those needs are, you know, and and looking to shore those numbers up and track where those pieces go uh, as you continue to move forward. Well, just on the soft cost side, uh, to kind of wrap things up, uh, something that we've seen for quite some time, most organizations have compliance requirements. Some of those compliance requirements exist uh, because of the nature of their business. Some of them exist in order to determine whether uh, the organization um, is worthy of winning new business. And we see sure. this a lot on the, the government consulting government side. side. Yeah. So when you start weighing business risks, which exist from simple audits and compliance to opportunity cost, you know, speak a little bit to to, to that um, as it pertains to um, you know where you're, where you're seeing businesses head and, and, and really focus around IT uh, budgeting. Yeah, so on the government side, it's been easy for the last couple of years because the government's been mandating the changes required in, in CMMC uh, as an update to, to NIST security standards 800-171. Um, but we're seeing it a lot more in, in healthcare uh, areas that touch healthcare, different things along those lines, um, certainly with, co with companies that are doing work with um, uh, European entities with uh, GDPR and different requirements that go along with, with those needs that are coming in as well. So uh, there's, there's certainly an effort. If you have not made a substantial effort to, to get compliant in those, you're generally going to find gaps uh, within those assessments and those needs that are coming out that are going to require um, some project delivery, some project planning, uh, definitely talk to your IT providers, you know, about those needs. And if, if they're not doing that um, or don't have a method of doing that, you know, um, shameless plug, we were certainly happy to help in, the, in those regards as well. So, yeah, if you are worried about uh, opportunity costs when it comes to IT, talk to, you know, your membership or sales, uh, yep. and, you know, part of the organization, because I'm sure they have, um, they are well aware of what, um, what standards and what seals and what uh, compliant language they need on their materials that are going to help the organization move forward. Okay. All right. 
leaky costs uh, on the IT <laughs> side. Um, talk a little bit about uh, understanding return on investment on IT expenditures. Yeah, so th there's leaks coming all over the place. You're going to find leaks all over the place, and and how big of a leak or small of a leak, you know, get into there. There's certain things like, um, you know, just renewing the the items that you've already renewed, right? Take an example of of like an Adobe subscription. You've got, you know, 20 of your staff members that are using the full fledged Adobe stack. Uh, within there and come to find out that two or three of these people only needed it for one initiative and they've no longer needed it, but you're paying, you know, 10 grand a year for them to maintain their Adobe stack that isn't even required anymore for that department. Um, different things along those lines, right? So that's where you're looking to, to seek input from your staff so that that you're not finding those those leaks against the, you know, uh, the subscriptions that, that they've got. We've already talked about the life cycle of, of the equipment and, and different things along those lines, but look at the life cycle of your AMS. Is it continuing to do what you need or are you having to do manual workarounds and you're having to do invest in other software to fill the gaps of what your AMS is? Is it time to look at, at revamping your AMS uh, entirely and, and, and looking at, at different needs um, that go along with those pieces, right? So, um, you know, when, when we talk about looking at the ROI as well, we want to make sure that we're, we talked a little bit earlier, compare, comparing that budget against the P&L through the year. Are you adhering to the budget as you're going? Are there other expenses that are leaking in and, and driving uh, those expenses higher than what, what we're planned for and, and continuing to make sure that, that those needs are, are being addressed? Um, but, you know, you want to make sure that you're lining those IT projects up against business initiatives and business needs that are, are going on within the organization. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit. And by the way, anybody who's on online has a question, feel free to drop your question in the Q&A section of, of the chat. We'd be happy to answer it as we as we move forward. But you talked a little bit about uh, on a previous, uh, previous part of this presentation around seeking input from staff at all levels. And yeah. as you start to see organizations move more and more to cloud-based applications, uh, where data and data warehousing is becoming more of a uh, of an interest and challenge and investment. Uh, wh where do you see um, some of these very niche organization specific software application needs coming into a crossroads of conversation when it comes to cloud, uh, you know, moving their infrastructure fully to the cloud from a server hosting environment? How how are you finding organizations either, you know, find opportunities to save or make sure they're making the right choices on their infrastructure to support you know future initiatives? Yeah, I, I would say, look, at this point, most people are headed to the cloud in a number of uh, software solution stacks, regardless. So, but it, it, it's a key, it's a key driver because you know, you're if you're looking to replace hardware or bring new hardware in, you're talking about a five to six year commitment, right? You're looking to gather to gain an ROI against that hardware over a five to six year term uh, for bringing that hardware in house. So, if there's an opportunity to move toward uh, hosting. Uh, or, or uh, cloud-based applications, you know, now is the great time to do it, right? So a couple of years, several years ago, it was you were an early adopter. Now it's moved into uh, main sprint, mainstream and almost on the cusp of, of becoming, you know, late to the party uh, in regards to going to the cloud. So, you know, these are the, that's definitely a consideration that you want to make uh, as you're looking at those things. And if, if your platform can be hosted in the cloud, do you have to provide the hosting infrastructure? Do they have a web-based version of their application that can be provided to you as a hosted application instead of requiring you to go out and get hosted? These are all considerations to take in. Um, most applications at this point are moving towards cloud-based uh, availability, um, which is certainly key, but, but you, wanna you wanna examine your cost of uh, say like an AWS or an Azure hosted environment and maintaining the applications yourself against the cost of those hosted applications and what do those pieces look like as well. Um, but either way, I think more often than not, if the situation allows, we're looking to move things away from being localized. There's more people working from home, you know, uh, than ever before. There's uh, there's just a greater need uh, for those uptime and the availability to work from anywhere um, that that cloud hosting uh, affords uh, without having to maintain a localized infrastructure. Great. One question that came in. Um, talk. Can you talk a little bit about budgeting? 
Um, and you mentioned kind of continuous compliance or continuous auditing uh, to inform a budget and this, this agile type approach to doing budgeting. Question came in around, you know, how do you look at your IT budget and then sit with, you know, executives or your management team and look at your profit and loss on a regular basis? And where does that come in play? And, and how do you feel like, you know, organizations are using that, that routine um, to continue to kind of evaluate technology as it aligns to the business? Yeah, I mean, I think you should have your, you know, I think your your entire management team should be a part of that, right? So, and and it should be reviewed. Different organizations are going to do it differently. We, I know, we review ours on a, on a monthly basis. We're looking at our P and L on a monthly basis. We're comparing it against our budget, and we're figuring out where we're hitting and where we're not. I think, you know, uh, that that's certainly, you know, one of the tightest uh, methods of of running that type of comparison. At a minimum, I would say you'd probably want to be doing it quarterly, make sure you're on track for, for where everything is coming into play. But we're running our entire PL against where our budget is. And, and, you know, again, if it's your first time getting into that, you identify the holes so that you can continue to do better next year. You can continue to put a revision out for the remainder of the year, different pieces along those lines uh, so that you can work to get better and better at it. I don't think, you know, anybody's going to start doing that where they haven't done it before mm-hmm. and get it right, you know, uh, right out of the gate. But it's a continuous improvement and you want to continue to move your business forward uh, as you're focusing on those. Well, that continuous approach, I would say, looking at your P&L and then looking at your forecast gets you into naturally this continuous evaluation of technology, right? I mean, I, sure. I, my background is in strategic planning. I love the idea of putting together one year and three year plans and then everybody laughs. So you put it on a binder, you put it on a shelf, you come, you dust it off once a year, see how things were going. That used to be the old school way of doing things. Now it's you put together a budget in a bit of a waterfall mentality, right? You put together what the best laid plans are today. Let's say it's October, November for the new year, knowing full well that plans are gonna change, priorities change, uh, markets change, your your departments uh, change in their initiatives and new things emerge. So looking, you know, getting into a routine of looking at your profit and loss, understanding what your technology investments are, and specifically knowing when you need to make those technology investments gives you the ability to make those pivots or changes or really look from a critical eye at the applications or the infrastructure that there's a support to then again get ahead and say, look, this in order for this initiative to take place, these are some of the new things we're going to need to start looking at to evaluate from a cost perspective that we didn't think of back in October because we didn't, you know, we were limited in our knowledge at that point. We've got in the next, you know, six to nine months that we've now gained a better understanding can make a better determination. Well, and you've got to look at it too. If you're making a wholesale change against business software, uh, like software that is heavily tied into your business, you're generally looking at a six to 12 month, uh, you know, roadmap of implementation there, you know, so you want to make sure that you're, you're accounting for, you know, you're basically paying double, double uh, costs for running your business. And those things need to be accounted for. And you want to make sure that you're holding to those pieces uh, before it, it can sprawl rather quickly. So, okay. Another question um, just asked uh, was really around elaborating um, IT budgeting planning for more diverse budget. The question is that we mentioned many companies moving toward cloud hosted applications yep. uh, to go even further. Can we talk a little bit about leveraging more managed services in the cloud in addition to serverless solutions within the cloud? Um, yeah, that's a that's a bit of a mouthful, I know, but we're talking about you know if we're talking about you know coming off of physical infrastructure and moving into the cloud, whether it's Azure, AWS, or a private cloud uh, hosted elsewhere, are there you know what are you seeing in terms of managed hosting and managed services around those, knowing that some of these applications are probably custom or they're yep. well known solutions, and that and the the choice of living in a private cloud is either for a compliance standpoint or um, just for you know more comfort and security standpoint. What what, what kind of discussions or, or conversations are happening you know, with the organizations that you've been working with? Yeah, so I don't think there's a one size fits all approach, certainly in regards to this, right? So uh, I, I think we, you need to look at your uh, uh, talk with your um, advisor, your technology team. Uh, and gain input there in terms of what makes the most sense, not only for, and you want to look at it holistically, not necessarily for the here and now, but where is this going to evolve over time? There's there, again, there is certain benefits to applications being hosted by a vendor and, and being presented to you with something like a QuickBooks online for accounting and different things along those lines. You know, that's not to say that 
that's not a wholesale shift either. Most of the, all of the functionality exists in QuickBooks Online that exists with localized QuickBooks, but a lot, there's a lot of changes that go into that, right? It's not exactly a non, it's not like it's a non-painful switch that you're making. Um, but, but those are certainly ideal if the cost works out. If you're looking at other solutions, we've got other clients that we have uh, that are running like private Azure hosted and we're doing uh, managed hosting uh, maintenance for them, right? Where we're doing monthly consulting. We're looking at long-term planning of where they're looking to go with their application, continuing to consult with them on, on an ongoing basis around what the changes and what the needs are and everything that goes into that um, and continuing to budget against those pieces. We've got other people that are, are just going into, you know, like a, a Azure hosting or AWS hosting where it's just a basic server and, and most of the, the, the base level support that comes under our mainspring contract covers the needs of those uh, hosted platforms. And again, it really depends on what the needs are, what the implications are. You know, if you've got a platform that is, you know, you've got a lot of sensitive data in, you've got a lot of different pieces along, you know, those are things that we'd want to consult on uh, slightly different than, you know, we're just putting an Active Directory server in, or we're just putting you into Azure AD or something along those lines. So I think it really does depend on the, on the situation, on the scenario. Um, and, and it's something that you should do a deep dive with your technology partner on. Yeah, and I, I would agree, uh, Jeremy. We talk a lot about, um, I work with a lot of organizations, particularly in the DevOps world, uh, where, where custom applications are just that. They're custom. They've either built off of a COTS or a commercial off-the-shelf program. They've made, you know, they've been tailored to, to custom or they've always been custom and they're continuing to try to keep this software application running and, and compliant without interrupting their operations. And I think when it comes to custom, whether it's building custom software or supporting custom software, uh, we take a very agile approach and we encourage our clients and organizations to start with what are the use cases, right? Rather than looking for features and benefits, what are the minimum viable uh, items that are needed? Start with compliance. Does your application have to meet certain compliance requirements from a security or usability standpoint? Start there, start simple and start plain, and then work your way down from what are what is the routine maintenance required in order to keep this, this application running? And then what are the future plans for those applications that you're gonna need to meet? Take those use cases and then start working with your IT team and your partner to then go evaluate the solution opportunities. Because like many applications, there's lots of great solutions out there. There are a lot of great uh, sales folks that do great demonstrations of bells and whistles, but without um, using a process of starting with that vin minimum viable acceptance criteria, you can find yourself in a whirlwind of just reviewing software, you know, reviewing solutions without really understanding what the minimum requirements are. And then you can get in this scenario where you're either locked in into a sticky product or you're overpaying for something that really didn't meet, you know, your minimum requirements or did it did, but didn't do it very well. So starting with your minimum viable um, you know, requirements and working your way forward and shopping from that pr perspective is usually where we start. And that whole sticky comment, I think is key. We see that a lot um, too, where realistically, um, a lot of uh, IT providers will look to move you into their hosting. So it'll give them a bigger margin. It'll give them, that benefits them. What is the benefit to you of, of putting your stack in their environment you know there are plenty of places that you can host whether it's azure aws um, different places uh, other places that are out there on the web as well um, what benefit is there for you to put your hosting within you know a provider that is just going to then make it that much harder for you to break away from that contract that ties you to them that doesn't necessarily give you any added benefits so make sure that you're weighing those if that's the direction that somebody's, you know, kind of moving you into that you want to really consider heavily. Well, hopefully one of the takeaways uh, from today's discussion uh, and sharing a little bit about how we do budgeting uh, internally for, for our organization uh, is that idea that budgets uh, are meant to be continuously evaluated, reprioritized and scrutinized and uh, really viewed from a lens of return on investment um, when it comes to aligning the priorities. So budgets are great to set. Accounting folks love having them. Management teams love looking at it going, how do we measure success, cost, schedule, performance? Really, at the end of the day, are we making the right investments short and long term? And are we really using 
the most recent data that's coming from our staff, from our end users, from our IT departments, from industry best practices and making these decisions and, and having that roadmap laid out in a very simple automated way to constantly evaluate what your choices are um, has, has become the norm. Most organizations have found savings and they've avoided overbuying or you know buy, um, or underbuying in, in some cases solutions that get them into a buying where they're now doubling down on the problem to get themselves out of it. One other one other comment uh, as we're talking about takeaways that I, I want to kind of put as another overlooked item um, is expected growth within the organization. So you know a lot of the times it's easy to take a look at what what's expiring over the next year. But talk a little bit, but you know, think a little bit uh, ahead in terms of the growth of your organization. You know, we're expecting to hire ten new employees this year. Well, that's going to additionally mean you know ten additional recruiting fees. That's going to mean ten additional computers. That's going to mean you know uh, all of the other technology that's needed. The licenses that are going to be needed for those people. Um, you know, Training. growth growth is a great problem to have, right? But you know, you want to yeah. make sure that it's accounted for as you're looking looking into that. Yeah, one of the, one of the items, the hard cost that's associated with it, and I, I kind of snicker because I think everybody has true, genuine intentions of investing in t in technology training or training in general. What's the first thing that happens? That that piece gets cut when it's left as a separate line item. So one of the things that I've seen uh, work uh, work well is you know working with your IT team or your IT partner is having training baked into every project or solution that you're rolling out. That should be a given. Um, and continuous training, training that's on a micro level, that's easy to repeat, that's available at a, you know, a self-service standpoint so that you can invest in something that has uh, a greater shelf life and it is not a one-time cost that you're hoping that retention levels reach you know, 60, 70%, something that's repeatable that can be rolled out to new employees and, and new folks or folks that need refresher training. So look at IT training and attaching those things, you know, th those priorities to the actual initiatives so that that item doesn't and get you know, lopped off the budget when it comes time to the quarterly review and you're having greater success with implementations. Okay, well, I think we have answered everyone's questions from the meeting. Uh, I want to share with everybody that we've got some old webinars that uh, we've actually referenced and talked about uh, that are up on YouTube and, and widely available. The automation and streamlining business processes through software development and, um, and tools that exist in everyone's uh, tool stack, likely, uh, in the Microsoft stack, as well as co combating um, cybersecurity risks using the CIS security controls. And then we talked a good bit about employee hiring and retention and the use of HR information systems. All of those webinars are available on demand uh, through our website and on YouTube. And hopefully uh, you will find them um, timely and helpful as you put together your IT budgets. Lean on your IT team and lean on your, your trusted partner to come to you with, with recommendations, uh, not just for next year, but uh, beyond and make sure that they're um, taking you know, full advantage of the tool sets that are available to, to, to make budgeting simple and automated. Uh, any parting thoughts, Jeremy, before we let go? No, I, I, I like uh, getting on here and, and, and trying to, to, to help. Uh, certainly, if you've got additional questions, send them over. We're happy to consult with you on it and talk to you uh, okay. as, as you move forward. Um, you know, I, I enjoy consulting with, with uh, new businesses. I enjoy consulting with our existing client base as well, but uh, really appreciate everybody's time here today. The next VCIO Perspectives webinar it will be on Wednesday, January 18th. It's going to be a focused uh, session on recession proofing your business or an organization and making sure that you're maximizing profit and efficiency through outsourced solutions uh, beyond IT. Uh, I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Jeremy, thanks for joining us today. For those that attended, have a great holiday. Uh, enjoy your time with your families and be on the lookout for your copy of your IT budget uh, into your email today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.